this week on Vice, the new era of cyber warfare. What we're talking about here is a total revolution of the whole concept of war. What's the significance of the military being a part of all of this? The Israeli army is the largest HR organization in the world. And then Japan rearms itself for the first time since World War II. There are hundreds of people here. They're all pissed off. That China keeps encroaching on Japanese territory. If China really goes for the military action, the cost they're going to pay is very bloody. Cyber attacks have gone from a vague threat to one of the most urgent security problems in the United States. During the 2016 presidential election, the Russian government hacked the Democratic National Committee and used the stolen emails to change the course of the campaign. And just this May, the largest ransomware attack in history shut down hundreds of thousands of computer systems around the world. More than 150 countries were hit by the attack and now are scrambling to fix their defenses. And while they do so, one country has emerged as a clear leader in this field, Israel. We've come to an underground car park just outside Tel Aviv to meet someone who's going to show us how easy it is to launch a cyber attack on almost any modern car. Just like any connected computer, everything that you connect to the internet is vulnerable at the end. So this is true the same way the cars. Ziv is using a wireless adapter that enables internet access to hack into the car's Wi-Fi, which is now standard on new vehicles. What's weird about this little experiment we're doing is that I've got no idea what it is that he's going to be trying us. So we're going to start small, playing a bit with our windows. So he's putting the windows up and down. Let's play a bit with her blinkers. So the left indicator's coming on, the right indicator's coming on. So now he's messing with the miles an hour thing. It's going all the way up to 220 kilometers an hour. The rev on this is going all over the place. This would freak you out if you didn't know it was being done on purpose. And now, he, now it's completely disabled, engine malfunction. The fact that he can do all of this means that he could very easily just ram us straight into that wall in front of us. That experience and the experiment that we just did then is probably the first time where I've thought hacking could physically cause harm to me. How many cars in the world do you think you could do the same thing to right now? Today, I would say that most of them are vulnerable or susceptible to hackers' attacks. Though there aren't any cars made in Israel, the world's top auto security companies are Israeli, and they're all parts of a wave of cyber innovation that's sweeping across the country. Israel's become a world leader in cyber technology, and all of the Israeli companies who are at the forefront of that revolution are inside this building. There are over 10,000 people here from all over the world, and what many of them have come here to hear is Benjamin Netanyahu, the Israeli Prime Minister, laying out why this country is a global leader in the field. A few years ago, I set the goal for Israel of becoming one of the top five cybersecurity powers in the world. It's a goal we have met. Today, Israel receives roughly one fifth of the world's global private investment in cybersecurity. You're in a wonderful business. It's endless. In fact, Israel receives more venture capital funds per person than any other country in the world has become known as the startup nation. To understand how Israel became a global leader in this field, we spoke with Israeli journalist and senior defense correspondent, Alon Ben David. As a very small community that is practically an island, you are completely surrounded with nations that you cannot cross to. Israel developed creativity uh, to compensate for its lack of resources and it is a country that needs to conduct constant surveillance on the neighbors, as a country which is under constant annihilation threat by 
other nations. Israel understood many years ago that going into wars and launching massive military operations, it bears almost unbearable prices. First in human lives, in, in terms of economic costs, in terms of international legitimacy. So cyber was the right answer for many things that Israel needed to do. Do you think Israel's private cyber security industry is essentially the child of the Israeli military's affairs. Oh, absolutely. The whole of the Israeli cyber industry relies on knowledge gathered by, by people serving in Israel's different security agencies and the military. Military service is mandatory for most Israeli citizens. And one of the largest parts of the Israeli Defense Force is its cyber and intelligence units. These entire units and some 20,000 cyber soldiers are now being relocated to Beersheba, a desert city which is quickly becoming Israel's Silicon Valley. This military industrial cyber complex is said to be the largest infrastructure project in Israel's history. We spoke with the CEO behind this $5 billion undertaking, Ronnie Zahavi. What's the significance of the military being a part of all of this? Because going to the service is compulsory, you can look at the Israeli army as the largest HR organization in the world. Because practically speaking, they start scanning the layers of the Israeli population and position the right people in the right places, especially in elite units. So if you think about it, you take somebody who is 18 years of age and you get them exposed to the state-of-the-art technology, to the highly advanced paradigms and methodologies. So when they go out of the service at the age of 23, 24, from an IBM point of view, or from EMC point of view, or from Intel point of view, somebody has already, con already conducted the screening and already selected the best they can get in that sense. But the initial screening and recruitment process for the IDF's most elite cyber units actually begins much earlier. In 2013, the Ministry of Defense helped create a national program for high school students interested in learning more about the realm of cyber. These after-school classes have become unofficial feeder programs for the IDF cyber units. We met with a recruiter for one of those units, C4I. We could not reveal her identity because of a security clearance. Mohamed Ideali, someone who I'm looking for, a young man, with a cognition, a very high level of young people in the world. Children who have their own strong skills to deal with technological problems in the cyber field. And so we are using our hands to the best and bring them to the field. I know that all of the branches are different, but there does seem to be some that stick out in the hierarchy. So, for example, A200 has... For decades, Unit H200 was a closely guarded secret, partially because this elite cyber and intelligence division doesn't just provide defense. In fact, they're responsible for one of the most aggressive cyber attacks in history. Stuxnet, a cyber attack that sabotaged the Iranian nuclear program by destroying centrifuges at the Natanz nuclear facility, is widely believed to be a joint operation of Unit 8200 and the NSA. And in 2014, 43 former members of 8200 wrote an open letter to the Prime Minister, refusing to serve because of the unit's widespread use of surveillance. We met with one of the soldiers who signed the letter. Israeli intelligence is everywhere, literally everywhere, in the Palestinian territories. It doesn't matter whether they're suspect of something or not, whether they're political activists or whatever. No one's off limits. What's wrong with that? If you're at war with another people and you've got complete surveillance, that sounds like quite a, an advantage. The problem is when it goes beyond plain security. If someone's about to do an attack in Tel Aviv, then I could see why we'd want to know where he is or where he's going. But if you've got his brother, his sister, his cousins, his cousin's friends, all of them tapped as well, then that's where it clearly crosses the line. If you find out that someone might be having an affair, someone is gay, when you come across that information, instead of it being put away as irrelevant, it's something that you would send forward and it would be used. If someone's cheating on their wife and the United 200 have discovered this, what's the benefit of having that information? Israel can approach them and get them to cooperate one way or another, be it get some information, go photograph some places. 
and what they get out of it is their secret is not been revealed. It's blackmail. Yeah, you can call it blackmail. Despite its shadowy reputation, one thing is clear. The skills and methods these soldiers learn in H200 are extremely profitable on the free market. These veterans have gone on to create tech startups worth billions of dollars, and the most prestigious tech companies actively recruit former H200 members. Sharon Nimorovsky served in one of the IDF's technological units before founding a company called White Hat Limited. Companies hire his team to attack their systems, to assess and then fix any weaknesses. So at the moment, around this table, your colleagues here are actually attacking They're a company. They're actually attacking a company. These days, it only takes an email to control you. I can send you a PDF file, and when he opens it, he gets a hostile file installed on his computer. After he gets it, everything he strokes on his keyboard is being transferred to the internet. Every password, every credit card number, every email you send. Now, what do you do with that data after you collect it? You sell it. You sell it on the darknet. Everything you just want to know, you can buy here. Business profiles, social security numbers of the employees, date of birth. Bronx Hospital in New York, they stole 34,000 patient records. Well, healthcare will be the most profitable information today. What's this? That's an email from Senator McCain. John McCain's emails uh, floating around the darkness. While the origin of Senator McCain's emails remains uncertain, the power of hacked emails and data breaches became abundantly clear during the 2016 election. President Obama blaming Russia for interfering in the US elections. Beyond the risks of data breaches and hacker markets, potential threats to critical infrastructure, including physical facilities, are also becoming indisputable. We met up with Barrett Perelman, an H200 vet and founder of Indigy, a startup that builds cybersecurity networks for industrial facilities that could be vulnerable to hacks. What happened in the last decade or so was the interconnectivity between these systems. I want access anytime, anywhere, to any place. Quite convenient, in theory. Convenient for the operators and making it more convenient for the hackers. The type of control systems that essentially manage the pumps and the valves in all of this facility were designed 20 years ago, 30 years ago. They are very easily penetrable, very easy to disable them, very easy to manipulate them. Could you do that? Um, so the short answer is yes. Barrett hacked into the reservoir systems to show us how dangerous a simple piece of malware can be. First, he shut down the valves which drain the sewage. Simultaneously, he manipulated the system's display to indicate that everything was operating normally. There's not a big red sign saying, alert, you've been hacked. Exactly. The eventual result of this would be the reservoirs filling up and having a toxic overflow. This is theoretical. Can you give me an example of where this has happened in the real world? So I like to refute the fact that it's theoretical because as recent as a few months ago in the Ukraine power grid that was being shut down, industrial control systems got hacked. A few years ago, we had reporting by the German government that a furnace was being blown up in a steel mill due to a cyber attack. It's the same industrial control system. If I hacked one of them, I can hack presumably all the others as well. This is, without exaggeration, the life-threatening attacks. If I hack into a pharmaceutical plant and I change the composure of the drugs, if I hack into an oil rig and cause an oil spill, if I create too much pressure in oil pipelines, all of these is no longer data and privacy issues. It starts to be safety and life-threatening situations. I have zero doubt in my mind that currently critical infrastructures in the Western world already have malware inside, just ready for someone to press that red button and shut off a power grid. The weapons are loaded, essentially. I think so. That's exactly the definition I've used. While cybersecurity companies become more and more in demand, the crippling potential of cyber warfare only continues to grow. What we're talking about here is a total revolution of the whole concept of war. It changes everything we thought about war, and how it's being conducted and what are the rules and who is the enemy and can you recognize the enemy at all? 
many countries have very dangerous uh, cyber tools. Some are using it viciously, like the Russians, like the Chinese, and are not shy of using them against other countries. We all understand the vulnerabilities of critical infrastructure, and we all understand the vulnerabilities of privacy. But what troubles me is the ability to affect the mindset of masses, the mindset of a public. The Russians were manipulating American public mindset. That's scary. And that, I suspect, would eventually undermine most of Western democracies in the coming decade. I fear that the good 70 years post-World War II of prospering democracies in the Western world and prosperity, economic prosperity, are over. After World War II, the Allies punished Japan for waging war in Asia by forcing it to disarm and to swear off having offensive military capabilities ever again. Over time, that pacifism became part of the Japanese psyche. But today, nationalism is on the rise around the world, and Japan has not been immune to this political tide. Tensions are on the rise in the Pacific, and now Prime Minister Shinzo Abe and his backers are rethinking his country's previously peaceful stance and moving to restore Japan's military might. I'm walking into a survival gaming spot. It's kind of like paintball. It's outside Tokyo, and it's clearly been designed to look like a war zone. You have all these guys in camo. It looks like American military gear. Konnichiwa. For the last 70 years, this is about as close as any Japanese citizen has come to being in combat. But if you ask the locals here, that might be about to change. You're mentioning the idea that Japan could be invaded. Who, who would invade the country? The threat from China is so obvious to these guys because the two countries have a very long, bloody history. The last time they came to blows was when Japan invaded China in the run-up to World War II. After Japan was defeated by the Allies, they were found guilty of war crimes that included the killing of millions of Chinese. The US forced them to adopt a constitution which renounces war and banned them from having any offensive military capabilities. Since then, pacifism has become a part of post-war Japanese culture with the military confined to self-defense only. But now, that might be changing. Today, the Japanese parliament approved a controversial policy to allow its military to defend allies in other nations, clearing the way for troop deployments overseas. This parliamentary resolution marked a shift towards militarization that's being pushed by Japan's prime minister, Shinzo Abe. Abe and his supporters argue that today, Japan needs stronger armed forces to defend themselves from their powerful neighbors and other global security threats. Hundreds of thousands of Japanese have protested Abe's reform efforts, which they say violate Japan's constitutional commitment to pacifism. There are a few thousand people in this protest, and they're all chanting for Prime Minister Abe to resign. They obviously feel like he's dangerous for the country. They're legitimately nervous that he could drag the country into war. Uh, why do you think this bill is dangerous for the country? But another loud voice is a growing group of ultra-nationalists called Nippon Kaigi 
who have gained a lot of influence inside of Abe's government. They want to go so far as to change the constitution to allow for attack-capable forces. Akira Momochi is the group's strategic advisor. Many people see this, though, as the first step in preparing Japan to go to war. But the line between defense and offense is starting to blur. Japan's 2017 military budget is its biggest ever, and the self-defense forces have demonstrated that they're expanding their capabilities on land, in the air, and at sea. This is the Izumo. It's one of Japan's brand new carriers. There's a constitutional ban against um, Japan having aircraft carriers, and so they actually classify this as a helicopter carrier. The Izumo looks so much like a conventional aircraft carrier that other countries have complained that it's a violation of Japan's pacifist commitments. I'm on top of uh, the outdoor elevator that brings all of the aircrafts from the hangar up to the deck. Critics have said that this carrier is only called a helicopter carrier because it's against the Constitution to have an aircraft carrier. What's your reaction to that? I've been on a U.S. aircraft carrier before, and this looks pretty much exactly the same. Could this transform into a carrier that could uh, deploy fighter jets like the F-35? Not only did the Izumo's commander concede that the ship could be converted into an attack vessel, but it was also recently deployed alongside an American battleship in nearby waters as a clear show of strength. These growing naval capabilities are exactly what Japan wants to project towards China, especially when it comes to their intensifying standoff over a small group of uninhabited islands. Nationalists from both countries frequently make their way out to the islands to plant their country's flag. One regular visitor is Satoru Muzushima, an influential conservative talk show host. Hello, how are you, Mr. Muzushima? Thank you for having me. Nice to meet you. Oh, thank you so much. Thank you. Okay. ご紹介いたします。今日はアメリカのテレビ局バイソンエチビオの記者でいらっしゃいますジアンナトボニさんにお越しいただきました。よくいらっしゃいました。Hello, hello. Thank you for having me. You have a beautiful set here. Thank you very much. Behind us, we have videos of the Senkaku Islands. What is your opinion of what's going on there right now between China and Japan? 私たちはあの歴史のいろんな資料とか調べて尖閣諸島が日本の領土であるということはあの確信しております。まずそういうことからあの私たちが今日本の領土の中で一番侵略の危険にあるというね。So do you think it's that would actually be realistic that war could break out there between Japan and China? ナチスドイツと最も近い近い。あるいはもっと言えばスターリンのソ連と一番近かった国があのナチスと同じですあれはあの国はそこをあの忘れてはならないと私は思いますでそれを軍事利用しようとしていると。でこういう中で我々が戦争をするんじゃなくて戦争を
これはあの憲法を変えて自分の国で守らなきゃいけないっていうそういうことですね。はい。This suspicion of an aggressive China appears to be growing as Japanese nationalists have also taken to the streets to demand a much stronger stance toward China. Tokyo. There are hundreds of people here, and what they're all protesting is Japan's relationship with China. They're all pissed off that China keeps encroaching on Japanese territory. We chartered a boat to the Senkakus to see the disputed territories ourselves. The Japanese Coast Guard intercepted our boat and jumped on board. So first, sure. Oh, first, can I just ask you,、um, why, why did you stop us? I want to talk to the captain. I understand. Yeah, I'm just trying to understand it because it, I don't think we're breaking any, breaking any laws. The Coast Guard cited an 80 year old fishing regulation as grounds to turn us away. But based on their past actions, they're concerned that an incident in these waters could spark an actual conflict. So much so that these same Coast Guard vessels will physically block civilian boats from reaching the islands. And the hostility on the water is escalating. China has been claiming, constructing, and militarizing islands in the nearby South China Sea, dangerously amping up tensions with the US and its allies in Asia. But if local hostilities did boil over into conflict, it would have major global consequences. Because the original post war agreements also stipulated that in return for Japan's pacifism, the US is legally bound to defend them. We are committed to the security of Japan and all areas under its administrative control. Retired Admiral Yoji Koda was once the commander in chief of Japan's self defense fleet. He made it clear that if Japan goes to war, the US is going with them. One of the fundamental reasons why Japan maintains the US Japan alliance. If anything, the aggression happens toward Japan, self defense force role is to repel those the invaders. No more than that. We can't strike their homeland. Japan fully depends on the strategic deterrence and strike capability on the United States if China really goes for the military action. The cost they are going to pay is very bloody. They know that. And Japan has the hardware and the personnel to exact that cost. Armed Japanese fighters regularly patrol contested airspace, including over the Senkakus, and they launch whenever they see Chinese planes doing the same, scrambling their jets more than 1,100 times last year alone. It's a tense waiting game between the world's three largest economies, and it could erupt into hostilities at any time. The closer they come, the more sensitive we become. And we send our fighters to say hello. We will not fire. We will not fire. We can't. Unless they fire first.